Uh, anyway, KE said in his video that if you use tight beats, you will be sued. So he's lying to rappers in order to take money away from producers. That's a new low. Then we'll jump in and see your topic. What's going down, everybody? It's the Music Entrepreneur Club podcast powered by BeatStars, BeatStars.live. We're live twice a week with our free music business mentorship program, Mondays and Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Check out musicentrepreneurclub.com or BeatStars.live. Before we start, I do just want to let people know about the text marketing webinars, too. Um, so going forward every Monday, so I have my live MEC session from 12 to 1 every Monday. And then at 1.30, I'm doing some text marketing, not even really webinars. It's more office hours where people can come and we can talk about their specific strategy for text marketing um, or talk about why you should have a strategy using text marketing. And Fan Connect is, is, is I think it's available now because it was integrated in BeatStars. It took it out to do some upgrades and I think it's back in. And if it's not back in just yet, it will be very soon. Uh, so whether you're an artist or a producer, tap into the Monday sessions. You can sign up for them if you go into our Instagram bio. There's a link to sign up, get a reminder, but join us every Monday at 1.30 p.m. Pacific. Yeah, and that goes to show you how ahead of its time BeatStars is as a platform because uh, I, don't, I don't see text marketing integrations you know, really anywhere. Uh, but that being said, I, I, I thought there were some valid questions about the Funk Volume podcast and you and Hobson and so forth, but I, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to cater to them anymore. Um, what these Hobson fans pointed out is that my last Dame Ritter interview was terrible. And a lot of them commented on how bad of an interview viewer I was. They wondered how I even got an interview with Dame Ritter out of nowhere. So let me just issue an apology. This whole time, I thought I was running a podcast with you, Dame. But in reality, I've just been interviewing you 82 consecutive times under false pretense that we have some sort of joint ownership of a music business mentorship program. So all the angry Funk Volume fans, I apologize. I don't want to further complicate your lives with my interviews as you have a lot more important things to deal with, like figuring out which foot to put in which pant leg and why your phone keeps putting those annoying red jagged lines under the words you type. So ignoring context clues must be exhausting and I commend you for your excruciating labor. I will say like any fan base, like the idiot ones are the loudest. So obviously for the most part, funk volume fans were awesome, super supportive, um, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's the small minority that is typically the loudest and they're the most annoying, the most ignorant, uh, the ones that are just, just, just blinded by their love and support of Hobson to even, you know, consider any other information. It's, but it's a small minority. So I don't want to make it seem like that's was the entire fan base. Cause that's, that's definitely far from the truth. I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. So uh, you wanted to talk more about uh, releasing music and, and jump a little further in depth and maybe provide some, some specific strategies rather than just, you know, general platitudes about marketing that I think we're, we're all sick of hearing. Yeah, well, we always get asked a question, or at least I always get asked a question about like how often people should release music of uh, how they should release music. And it's a very hard question to answer because, you know, I think every artist needs to develop their own strategy. But in general, these days, you know, it requires a lot of content to, 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 to build momentum, typically. I mean, every once in a while, there might be a song that pops off and they maybe would never put out music before. And it just so happened that this first song went off and, and, and did crazy, but that's not typically how it happens. Like it typically takes a lot of content, um, a lot of consistency to start building the momentum and start building the fan base that you're gonna need to be successful. Um, and I think a lot of artists overthink every single release because they think that the next release is going to be the golden ticket. The next release is what's going to take them from 10 followers to 10 million. Uh, when in reality, and I posted this the, the other day, like that sometimes the best promotion for a song is another song, right? Even when you, even when 
things start to bubble for you if if and when that happens like you want people to come back to a catalog of music that they can enjoy and indulge themselves in so that they become a fan and really get to know who you are so sometimes the best promotion for a song is another song that being said you should have a release strategy for a single song but you should also have a strategy for how that song plays into your strategy for the next 10 and 20 songs. Um, and I'm always a big believer. Obviously, you know, we, we've, you've heard us say this a lot. You have to have a compelling story. You have to have a compelling messaging and compelling branding. I think everything that you do should be more, stri- should be strategic, right? Why are you releasing your songs on it? Like, let's just say you, re- you, start, you decide to release a song every, every first of the month, right? Why are you releasing it every first of the month? Why did you pick the, the first of the month? How does that play into the story that you're trying to tell? You know, maybe there's a particular time you do something. Why are you doing it at that time? That could tell you something else about who you are. The most generic and kind of played out version is like, you know, stoners dropping something at 420 or on 420, right? That obviously is not a random date. They picked it because they buy into that culture. They're a stoner. It starts to tell a little bit about the story. So I had a, a guy hit me yesterday who's a rapper, dope rapper, um, also an actor and a comedian. And when I listened to the music, it kind of, it was good, but I'll be honest, like a lot of rappers can rap. A lot of rappers just kind of make good music. It's not like, oh my gosh, I got to listen to this more and more. So you have to figure out a way to differentiate yourself with the other content that you're putting around this music. The idea that I, I pitched to him just, and, and it's not to take this, it's not to take this specific advice and run with it. It's to listen to the advice and try to understand like how I'm thinking about it and how I would go about it. Given that he's an actor, I was like, okay, on TikTok. Payne, have you seen those those duet videos where where actor where rappers like trade off bars? It'd be like mm-hmm. four bars, and then they'll leave four bars open. Then they'll go back in for four bars, leave four, four bars open, so it like goes back and forth. Yeah, I did. I did one with Biddle for for rap chat. I did. Yeah, rap. so I was like, beat, but just to be clear, so I was like, why don't you do that? like against yourself, if you're going to, if you're an actor and, and if you want to share that part of your story, that part of message with your music community, that's an easy opportunity to play two people and do it yourself and have that be a series of consistent content that you put out. Right. If I was, you know, or he could, if, if he wanted to do impressions and he wanted to do like a rap battle or something like that, he could play, and this is playing into trending topics because that's something that's huge that you might want to do. You might want to play into trending topics. And if you're a sports fan, you know that James Harden got traded to the Nets yesterday. And there was a little bit of a, there was some passive aggressive beef between John Wall, who's on the Houston Rockets, uh, because he felt like, well, the whole team felt like Harden wasn't really playing because he was disgruntled with his situation in the organization, yada, yada. So there was, you could have set up a, you could have done an impression of John Wall and 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 James Harden, set it up in a duet style, and have them like battle back and forth on, on TikTok. Obviously, if it's good, I guarantee you something like House of Highlights will pick it up, ESPN will pick it up. I mean, that's what um, there's a group of young comedians that always do like sports sports stuff and they always play on the trending topics and they've garnered a, a crazy fa- I can't remember his name off top I think his handle is something like at supreme or something like that but that's not the point so when when, when these release strategies for songs or or content you, you got to be consistent um you know maybe try to play into trending topic if that's part of your brand you know I wouldn't try to just 
be extra and weird just to do it, just to try to get attention. Think about things that play into your brand. Obviously, the cat that hit me up, he's an actor. So I'm thinking about, okay, how can we tell the story of him also being an actor and create some cool, engaging content? And it's something that he's comfortable doing because he's going to need a lot of these. If he commits to do it weekly, it's got to be something that's easy enough to commit to do it weekly and make sure that he doesn't miss a week. Um, So how much music should you guys be releasing? I would say that you should at least be releasing a song a month, at least a song a month. And during that means during that month, you should be creating content that pushes that, whatever that song is, right? Maybe it's some remixes, maybe, um, you know, you're getting other people to collaborate with you in some way. Uh, maybe it's a dance challenge, uh, whatever it is, you should have a, a plan for that p- specific song. But I think it should also tie into a longer term vision of your song. Like maybe you call these releases something specific that also kind of shares the story of, of your brand, right? I know Chris Webby was doing Webby Wednesdays. Um, uh, Toby Nwigwu, he was doing his, his, his uh, Get Twisted Sundays. Like I think, Sometimes it sounds corny, but it branding your releases is very effective. And I think it creates a lot of if, if you have them on certain times and your fans get to know that it, get, it builds some anticipation. Um, and obviously, if this is if it's Get Twisted Sundays 74 and people find out about you on the 74th one, they obviously know that there's 73 more that they haven't seen. So maybe they go back. And they listen to that. And then you can also put these releases in a playlist um, on YouTube or or on Spotify. Because if you spare, if, because if, because if instead of sharing the individual link to your song, you, you share the playlist link, it's going to automatically play the other ones after that every time you release it. Um, so it's difficult to give people a whole release strategy. And I I know I'm paying, I know I've been talking for a minute, but it's difficult to give people a whole release strategy every time somebody asks that question, because I don't know anything about you. I don't know your brand. I don't know what you're capable of. Like some people aren't, aren't, aren't good enough yet to put out a song a week like that. That's a lot for some people. Um, So there's a lot of variables that are missing. And sometimes it's really tough to understand that question. I mean, to answer that question, but you know, I just would encourage everybody to be strategic in every decision you make when you're putting out your music, the time, the day, what it's called, uh, the series, like everything needs to be strategic. That's one of the toughest conversations. And, and I, I also see that conversation as being a big part of uh, a conversation we had a couple podcasts ago about rappers who you know, are DIY, they release music and that pressure that they put them, that they put onto themselves for each individual release, I suspect um, plays a big part in how they interact with the producers they're getting beats from and and what that dynamic is like. You know, I, I had that example of the guy I had a conversation with on Instagram about it who claimed that producers didn't deserve any royalties because he worked so hard each time he released a song and he put in X amount of dollars. And I think he was releasing maybe a song or two a quarter. And so that's a lot of pressure to put on these songs. Uh, and when those songs don't become your golden ticket in terms of their success, and you're spending all this money on, you know, playlisting, which as we saw with the big Spotify playlist purge and, and view purge is probably not the smartest idea. You got to really be careful about that stuff. But if that's, if that's your strategy and you're putting so much energy into these individual song releases and they don't blow up the way you want them to, it's going to be discouraging and it's, it's going to be disappointing. And um, it it might affect the way you view the entire music economy. So there's no easy answer. You know, some people's strategy is just at least a million beats every year and just keep dropping music. Some people's strategy is, you know, drop a song a quarter. And there are people who, who win off of each strategy and there are people who fail off of each strategy. I, and what you were saying is that there are all of these different factors, but the the, the biggest thing is, 
what your intention is and, and what your uh, strategy is, how intentional is your strategy? Uh, because that's, that's one way to maximize success and minimize risk. Yeah. So, I mean, so for, for every single, you should have like a system for how you do things when you, when you put things out, that's consistent across every single you put out. Maybe there's a certain Facebook, ad, maybe there's a, there's a certain ad budget. Um, maybe you're, you're uploading it to, to Spotify a few weeks in advance so you can pitch through their Spotify for artist system. Maybe you have an email list that you send out to let people know about it. Maybe you have a text list. And then for every, every social media platform, you're creating content that makes sense for that, that platform. And then that's kind of like a system that, that's consistent for every single release. But then there might be a particular release where you have a more creative idea for, let's just say the song's called Ice Cream and you have a local ice cream shop that you want to pitch it to. I like then, this idea. And then maybe, maybe I've never used, I've never used this one particular. This one just came up random. But like, I, so I'm just, I'm just, just brainstorming on the spot. So maybe the song's called Ice Cream and you have a local ice cream shop that you want to pitch it to. Maybe there's a little bit of a, a sponsorship. Maybe it doesn't come in the form of money, but they allow you to use the shop to create some content. So video, um, a short, maybe like a short video or like a, a thriller video or a TikTok video or something like that. Um, or maybe you pitch it to a bigger brand or something like that. So there's going to be more creative. You should always be creative, but maybe a certain song triggers more creativity or maybe there's another artist that putting you know that, that that's branded around ice cream and you're like oh i'm putting out this ice cream song maybe they want to collab because it fits their brand too so it opens up an opportunity to collab with somebody so you should definitely have a system for how you release your music and you should be fine-tuning it over time adding things to it not typically taking things away unless you're unless you find that something you're doing is just completely not working but adding to it over time being consistent and then every once in a while you might have put out a song that you didn't think was going to, you got a different react, got a much bigger reaction. So maybe this stuff that you do for that song is after it comes out to breathe more life into it because it just caught on and you didn't in, in a way that you didn't expect it to. So you have to be willing to be flexible because you can always breathe life into music these days. I mean, a song might jump off that you put out a year ago, two years ago. Now you got to be like, okay, wow, this is picking up steam. What can we do to put fuel on the fire to, to take advantage of this? Uh, Cause there, there, so there's so much going on or that can happen uh, you just have to have a real good understanding of your brand. You have to be very creative and you have to put together a lot of content for all these different platforms and be consistent with it. It's hard work. It's super hard work, but you can do it. And the people that do it successfully are going to find success. You know, what messes all of this up is that sometimes it just happens randomly. Like it happened for me and Ted Park. Uh, but what, we learned from that was uh, you really have to maximize that success when it does come number one and number two, there's no way to duplicate luck or I don't know what to call it. I, maybe you would call it luck. Cause I think it was luck. the first song that we make together from scratch charts and we had no strategy and no plan. It's yeah, kind of but I don't like people. I don't like people hearing that because okay, that's 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 that happens. If for let's just say fifty songs are successful, maybe three of them it happened that way, yeah. and then we hone in on the three or people, and that's what we talked about a week ago or two weeks ago. That's putting your career on a roulette wheel. Like, no, that that's my that's the, my point. Focus on the forty-seven. Yeah, that's that's my point because you do see a lot of people say, "Well, such and such a rapper." did that strategy and it worked and it's always the exception to the rule it's never the rule so i mean if you want to chase exceptions and chase luck those are things that you can't create you can't intentionally create luck for yourself i don't believe and you can't intentionally create accidental success either so like i said with with the ted park record we haven't been able to duplicate that everything has been planning and strategy after that successful record that just happened randomly so you know and then i don't know you got me thinking about ice cream because before i became super healthy and started actually incorporating diet 
into my my health regimen. I knew I was going to join a gym that was going to impose a diet onto me. So I ate ice cream for like two weeks straight and they tested because it's a medical gym um, and they tested my my blood and my A1C was super high, like damn near in the pre-diabetic range. So I'm, I'm really miss ice cream. Uh, <laughs> did you did you want to continue about? Uh, but the, well, the la- I think a good example, like the, the popular example of like things taking off, is the, is the recent Bus It Challenge. There's that that video, and I don't even know the young lady. I think it's Erica something. E- Eric, that's her name. Um, you, you've seen the Bus It Challenge. That when- Erica Banks. Erica Banks. Yeah, obviously, there's a lot of people doing the Bus It Challenge. It's mostly women, but I, I've seen some men do it as well. Um, but there's also a video, I think it's, they say it's months before. So I'm assuming it's a few months, maybe four or five months, whatever. There's a video of her performing this song in front of a a large crowd. Unfortunately, they, they weren't wearing masks. That's disappointing, but that's besides the point. Um, and she was performing this song and everybody was looking around like, what the hell is this? Like, like nobody knew the song. Nobody was paying attention to her. And now I'm sure if she goes back to that same club or party, it's going to be cracking because simply because of a challenge. Now, I don't know how this was rolled out. I'm not sure if it was strategic or if it was luck, um, but it can happen. And you ha- if Erica is sitting on a catalog of very good music, this is going to be way more profitable for this moment is going to be way more profitable for her than if I go to her page and she don't have any other music besides this song. Um, so continue to be consistent in your releases. You, you, you can, as you get smarter about how you move, um, it's going to be a lot less about luck. Yeah, I'm looking um, at her, uh, her YouTube page. Obviously, Busted is the, is the hit, but she's been putting out a lot of content uh, over the last year. And, you know, music videos, full official music videos. And, you know, she's gaining traction. It's just that this this is a good example of trying to maximize on uh, the success of one single because leading up to Buss It, she was getting, you know, a thousand views, 20,000 views, 5,000 views. And then bus comes along and, and it's at over 2 million. But you know, the video that she uploaded before she, she, she put up the audio for the bus at record. It only got 5.7 thousand before that 4.3 thousand before that 3.4 thousand. So you have to consider the journey of an artist it's not just even even once you have success like that it's not easy that's the point i was trying to illustrate with the ted park example yes we got lucky yes the universe smiled on us for that release but every other song has been a challenge nothing else has been effortless we haven't just dropped another song randomly and had a a, a ton of success and a bunch of eyes on us it was hard work he went on on back-to-back tours you know if it's if it's one thing that I can really agree with Hobson on, it's that touring can really be hellish. And so for him, for Ted Park to go on back-to-back tours um, and really just grinding it out that way, that's work. That's not an accident. So, so I would, I would, I mean, not to detour this conversation, but I, it, it, touring takes you out of your element. But when you get to a point where you're on a very nice tour bus and like, like that's different than the van crowded in a van. And I don't know how Ted Park was traveling, but like. It was crowded in a van. So that's a different experience. So, you know, I personally, if you sign up to be an artist, and again, I'll go, we'll come back to the release. If you sign up to be an artist and, you know, if you don't like to tour, I guess that's on you. But, and everybody can have their opinion on whether touring is strenuous or not. In my opinion, like you, you get to a certain point, you have a very nice tour bus. The whole back of the tour bus is yours. Um, Yeah, it sucks to be away from home and out of your element, 
But in terms of like how much work you're doing every day, like you're getting off the bus, you're doing a meet and greet for an hour. So you're just taking pictures and, and signing autographs. And then you get on stage and you perform for about an hour and you do that, you know, five times a week. Like that's all of the work that you have to do. And to me, you know, I know some people might find that stressful and, you know, that might be hell for some artists, but to me as an artist, that's what you sign up for. And I think for most people from the outside looking in is like, why are you complaining? You know? So there's different levels of touring is, I guess, is my ultimate point. The very beginning, I mean, you should even enjoy that because it's, I mean, to, to have fans leave their house, pay money, maybe pay for a babysitter uh, to come see you perform, you should show appreciation. Like that's, I mean, that's, that's a lot easier than clicking like on a post. I mean, that's a lot harder, sorry. It's a lot harder and more time and money spent. So, and these are the people that are supporting your career. It's the reason why you have the life, hopefully, you know, that, that you wanted. Um, so, you know, I can't tell people, I can't tell Hobson that, Hey, you should like touring should be a blessing and you should look at it this way. It's the way I look at it. Uh, but I, I would encourage most artists to, you know, and I, I think, I don't think most artists have the same perception of touring. Like I know a lot of artists that love touring. Oh yeah. Most, most artists love, I mean, everyone I've toured with, you love when we toured, uh, and granted, they were short tours. They weren't like the two month long tours that I would go on with Soul, um, or even like the three three week, four week long tours that I would do with Coast to Coast. It, uh, it was you were happy the whole time. You were calm and even tempered, and I'm just sitting there trying to hide it, you know, my emotional state from everybody. But that being said, I'm Team Dame all the way. On this one topic, I'm Team Hobson. I'm sorry. I, it, and I agree with everything you're saying from a logical standpoint. Absolutely. And and even from an emotional uh, standpoint, it's it's amazing to have people. I love getting on stage and playing in front of people. That's the amazing part. Maybe Hobson disagree. I, I've, I forget exactly what he was saying, but... Yeah, he was saying he loved the touring. It was everything surrounding or he he loved the performing and you know the energy and and everything surrounding that was what was bothering him and what was, you know, kind of, you know, if if you're a tortured creative with perhaps mental illness with under under uh which I think I fall categorically speaking um then yeah it, it's it can affect you in in a lot of ways um that yeah well i think logical there like there's nothing depression and anxiety and all these things they they are what they are because they defy logic and but, yeah i mean i think that's all fair and i think that's the, the a dope thing about the music industry today is it, you can be a successful artist without touring. You can make a lot of, you can make a lot of money without touring. Um, and, and if, and if touring's not your thing, you should communicate that to your team, um, to your label, if you have one, to your manager, because if touring, if the, if no, if, if you're a manager of an artist and you're thinking that, oh, wow, like as we get going, touring is going to be, I'm going to be able to make some money from, from touring. And then if an artist says, well, I don't tour, you know, the manager and whoever's involved should be aware that that revenue, don't depend on that revenue stream. Um, so you have to communicate that with, especially before anything gets set up, right? Don't let people be out here routing tours and setting up tours and then you're like, well, I don't like touring or I'm going to leave this tour or whatever. Like I that. see where that's this is going. I see what that's, that's, com that's completely out of pocket. Um, so no, it just goes to generally about communication on the team. Like, cause when I jumped into music, you know, I signed up to do everything to, to I want to be the, the biggest, I want to be as successful as we can be. Um, 
And if artists are telling me that they don't do certain things, I need to know that up front. So I need to know not to expect money to come in from that revenue source. No, I agree. I think this this got personal. Um, let, let me talk about something else then. Uh, if you're cool, we'll be switching topics. Um, sure. So I was... One of my own videos, I woke up because I schedule all my YouTube um, beat uploads the night before or, or in advance. And I went to just, you know, check to see how the views were doing. The video loads, I see an advertisement from a producer being run on my video. The producer's name is KE on the track. If you're in the producer community, you probably know who he is. Um, he's a he's a platinum producer, multi-platinum producer, known for a few hits in, in kind of the early 2000s. Um, and for the past 10 years, he's been better known for DM and email spam. Uh, anyway, KE said in his video that if you use tight beats, you will be sued. So he's lying to rappers in order to take money away from producers. That's a new low. Uh, he's spending his ad money to target tight beat videos on YouTube to spread these lies to rappers searching for beats on YouTube. So if you're a rapper looking for a tight beat, before you even see the beat, you're showing an ad with this gentleman, KE, saying, if you use this beat, it's you're more than likely going to be sued. Verbatim, he said, you're more than likely going to be sued. I would bet my life savings that he can't name a single instance in which a producer sued a rapper over a tight beat. It's, it's a lie. It's a lie that's meant to uh, undercut and undermine the hardworking producers of the internet who are using the YouTube platform. And honestly, I feel sorry for him. Um, to, to me, licensing beats online is good business. You know, you make beats, you set the prices, you display the terms, and the customer automatically gets their beat files. KE is just choosing an immoral path, and you have to feel bad for a person who does that. I, I posted about this on Twitter, and of course, people immediately started replying with their own KE stories about him making uh, money off of them and not giving them anything in return. These aren't my stories to tell, um, but, you know, him spamming what, them relentlessly. What's, what's the advertising? What's the advertisement for, though? Like, okay, he's he's trying to get people not to buy type beats, but what is he trying to get people? What is he selling? Let's do this. I have a email from him that I actually got last year. It's from KE on the track. The subject is, I want to be your producer. So already is it's a lie because he doesn't want to be my producer because I'm not a rapper. I am a producer. So you can't be my producer. <laughs> Uh, and the email reads, and, and everybody has gotten this email. They can quote it. They were quoting it on Twitter and posting screenshots. It's the same email. It's probably gone out to, at this point, 100,000 people. It reads, I'm not going to waste your time. This is platinum. That's a lie. This is platinum producer KU on the track. My manager sent me, he misspelled me, some music you recently posted on your social, and I think you have a lot of potential. Another lie. We are on lockdown in our cities which is true. So because I can't leave the house, I decided to focus on producing up and coming artists like yourself. I am not a recording artist. So straight to the point, would you be interested in me producing four exclusive tracks for you? Let me know if you want to work. Let's win. So that answers your question, Dame. This is what he's trying to do. He's trying to sell his beats by trying to discourage rappers from buying other producers beats. If you search for him, there was a horrible video out uh, by a young woman. I can't pronounce this username. I believe she is. She's a recording artist. And she posted this story saying, you know, that he reached out. She paid, you know, $1,500 or something ridiculous for this four exclusive beat pack. And she got nothing in return. And then, um, official lace the floridian posted a screenshot of the exact same email i received uh saying he has been messaging my email for nearly four years 
uh, and uh, Dynasty underscore Mix on Twitter said, dude, scam my boy out of $1,500. And then someone replied and said they, they got someone for like 2000 So this isn't small money. This isn't a $50 beat guide. This isn't a $20 world star submission fee. This is, this is big money. And it's, it's unfortunate, but my question is this, our, our producer community loves sharing, right? We share drum kits, we share memes. Why don't we share this kind of information with the same level of energy? Why are the same people who were lying to us and taking our money 10 years ago, still doing it today? Um, <laughs> I don't know. We're sharing it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's unfortunate that this stuff works, um, you know, and I, I think people are people are just shady, man. I don't know what, what else to say. And, you know, I just go back to the same thing to protect yourselves against the shady ass people is you got to learn the business and, and surround your people and surround yourself with people that are solid because there's definitely solid people out there. There's solid people. And typically if you meet one solid person, you know, they're connected to others. And you, so you protect yourself with education, you protect yourself with, with network, um, you know, and, and, and hopefully if you do fall victim to some of these scammers, then you just learn and it never happens again. Uh, you know, I'm skeptical of a lot of, I mean, I'm skeptical. I was telling, um, I was telling a homie this morning, like I'm skeptical of any, everybody with a, and I, I don't even know if I'm hating, like I'm not, I'm not a hate. I don't know if I'm a hater for, for feeling this way, but I'm skeptical of everybody with the cash app in their bio. Um, I mean, it doesn't, it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't put me off of like working with someone, but if I see that, I know I got to do more research at least. Um, it's not like if you have a cash app in your bio, I, I will never rock with you. But to me, that's that's a sign that I need to, you know, proceed with caution and do more research because um, I'm sure there's people that are solid that have a cash app in their bio. Yeah, but I know what you mean. Um, a lot of people just put the money first and uh, don't even necessarily. I don't know. It, it's. It goes, yeah, it goes back to education, but it also goes back to ego. And I don't mean ego in the sense that most people understand, which is, you know, someone's cocky and they have an attitude and they think they're the greatest thing on earth. I mean, ego in the psychological sense where we just have this thing about us that, uh, that, that, makes us easy targets when someone appeals to our ego. When someone says, my manager, hey, I'm a multi-platinum producer and my management showed me your music and I love it. it. It's the same as someone saying, hey, this is a representative of Def Jam and we love your music. Or, you know, somebody saying, hey, your your music should have way more views. DM me and I can I can hook you up with some playlists. All of these are sales pitches and they're all based on lies, but they're based on these appealing lies because they appeal to the person's ego. They, they, they're, they're complimenting you. And sometimes that's all it takes. Sometimes all it takes is for someone to compliment you. And next thing you know, they're in your pockets. Well, we're talking about scams again. And I really would like to go at least four episodes without talking about scams. Um, you know, even though, even though they're prevalent, uh, but just a little tri a little tip for those out there that are getting these random emails sent to you. If people aren't dress addressing you specifically, because it happens with the comedians I work with too. And I just trash a bunch of emails, right? If somebody reaches out and they're not addressing you specifically, and you can tell that it's a copy paste message, it goes straight to the garbage for me. Like if they're not, if, if they're saying they love our content and they're not giving me an example of a specific sketch or something like that to let me know you did your research and you are truly like reaching out to Big Ja or Minx, it goes straight in the trash. And just knowing that you can probably avoid 90% of the scams. 
So I don't even understand how this tickles some people's egos if it's not even something that's specific for you. And you can tell. It's easy to tell. Your name's not even in the email. None of your content is being addressed. Like none of your specific content is being addressed. It's clearly a cut and paste job. So to me, that's 95% of the scams. They should go straight to your block or spam or delete. Fully. You, you shouldn't even read through the whole thing. Well, hopefully this goes beyond the realm of internet and music business scams because I, I've seen people who are just charming take advantage of people. It, they weren't trying to, you know, scam you into buying their beats. I'm just talking about in life. And if if all it takes for you to let your guard down is somebody complimenting you and giving you a smile, which is the equivalent of one of these emails saying, hey, I checked out your music. It's hot. Send me some money. Here's my cash app. Then you have a lot of work to do. And there's no shame in that. There, a lot of people don't want to share their stories because they, they were taken advantage of. They feel weak. They feel embarrassed. It happens to a lot of us. It happens to a lot of us. Hey, my, my computer about to die, man. So let's wrap this up or I, or I have to go grab my charger. That's my fault for not bringing it in here. Got it. Let's, let's wrap it up. Dame's computer has an ego. Um, shout out to everyone tuning in. This is the Music Entrepreneur Club podcast episode 82, a.k.a. DJ Payne One interviewing Dame every week. And uh, this is powered by BeatStars. Every Monday at 3 p.m. and every Thursday at 3 p.m. we have our free music business mentorship program. Tune into that, BeatStars.live, and then they can also text a number to get alerted every time we go live. What's that number, Dame? 844-206-7800. Text MEC to 844-206-7800. You'll get an alert before we go live. All right. Appreciate you watching. Peace. Peace. All right, Penny, my shit about to die.